Well, thank you all. I know you've all probably had a very long week, so I'm excited to talk about privacy in Web3, which I think is a super, super important topic and one I'm glad uh, we get to cover in funding the commons. Um, so to start, I'm Henry Stern. I used to work at Protocol Labs, where I worked on the Filecoin consensus algorithm. And I uh, recently started a company called Privy to work on data privacy in Web3. So if nothing else, I think my takeaway from this is hopefully to convince you that privacy is one of the big issues uh, that we get to work on in the space and one in which Web3 has a major impact to have. Um, with that, in this talk, I'm gonna try and get through a few things. So we'll start off talking about commons and coordination. Why uh, am I talking about Web3 so much? Uh, we'll then jump to privacy and trying to see how is privacy a commons on the web? What can we do about it? Um, I'm then gonna shill for a little bit and talk about what I'm working on before uh, talking about ways to look forward on how we can actually fund uh, privacy on the web. So with that, I'll kick us off with a story. Um, so I'm sure many of you have read this. It's a really, really great piece in Slate Star Codex called Meditations on Moloch. So what is Moloch? It's from a Allen Ginsberg poem. Moloch, the incomprehensible prison. Moloch, whose mind is pure machinery. Moloch, whose eyes are a thousand blind windows. And I underlined a few words here, incomprehensible, machinery, blind. I think because the definition of Moloch traps is that they make us feel like we have absolutely no agency over our place in society and over the systems in which we live. And uh, to take a step back, a Moloch trap, uh, explains Slate Star Codex, is a situation in which, for lack of coordination, as humans, we fall into a global minima, a place where no one's happy, uh, no one knows how we got there, and no one knows how individually to do anything about it. So the implicit question is, if everyone hates the current system, who perpetuates it? And Ginsburg answers Moloch. It's powerful, not because it's correct, but because thinking of the system as an agent shows you the extent to which it isn't an agent. Um, and this is where coordination will come and save the day. Uh, I'm going to jump now to talking about Bitcoin, obviously, because there's a very clear transition from one to the other, and I'll try and explain it. Uh, if you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin at a high level is a set of transactions which, along with proof of work, meaning uh, a reward to fight double spent, leads to a verified ledger, an ordered set of transactions that you can agree on without any single party maintaining a state. Uh, in you know English, that means you have shared state, you add incentives, and you get coordination. And to that end, I think it's a fair statement to say that Web3 as a socioeconomic project beyond the economics, or the, I guess, yeah, as a socioeconomic project is really about marshalling economic resources. It's about coordinating people who otherwise don't know each other, systems that otherwise have nothing to do with one another. And so, you know, you might say, why should I care about this? Um, and for that, I'm gonna take a step back and, and, and try and define commons. I was clearly uh, excited about the prompt. I, I think commons can be defined as a shared resource managed privately. So there are things which we all have a, a say in or all depend on as humans, uh, which we all have to manage together, but on whom we have individual impact. That is to say that the tragedy of the commons is that in these systems, we can sort of exploit them for privatized gains, even though the losses are socialized. Um, the obvious really good example is, uh, is the environment. Uh, and so you should care because, you know, doom and gloom is upon us. Uh, but beyond that, I think you should care because we fall into this state of, I think, despair when we are faced with commons or tragedy of commons, which is we feel completely powerless as individuals to do anything about it. Um, and so what I'm hoping you'll come away with is that we have an opportunity through coordinated action to actually do something to topple a system that at first glance seems to be completely uh, beyond repair. So with that, I'm gonna try and talk about privacy as part of this system. And I actually think there's a good analogy here between global warming and privacy in that if you ask people, do you care about global warming? Most everyone is gonna say yes. If you ask, and if you check what are they doing about it, most people don't do that much. I took a plane very recently and blew through my carbon for the air. Uh, and I think likewise in privacy, it ranks super, super high in stated preference, but it's something that we kind of feel powerless to do anything about. Um, so before we, I, I'm kind of answering the question up front, but I'll ask, is privacy a commons? And in order to get into it, I'll, I'll try and define privacy. This is Wikipedia. 
Uh, privacy is the ability of an individual or a group to seclude themselves or information about themselves and thereby express themselves selectively. In the words of my co-founder, whom I love to embarrass, and I think quoting her will do just that, privacy isn't about no data being shared, it's about control over data. It's about putting users in control over what they share and with whom. And so is privacy a commons? Let's take a simple example. Alice and Bob have a secret, or Alice has a secret in this case. We are operating in a state of privacy. Alice decides to share the secret with Bob. They now both know the secret. The system is still private. Unfortunately, Bob spills the beans. Uh, we have lost privacy in the system. And so what we can see is that, you know, privacy in a sense is shared state that requires multi-party coordination in order for the information to only be given to the appropriate parties all of the parties who know the information have to abide by a common set of permissions. And so, you know, the answer obviously is that yes, I think privacy is a very good example of a common good. Um, and, you know, you can see it in a few other ways. First, an erosion of individual privacy, I think, leads to collective erosion of privacy. Uh, if you give up on your own privacy, in a sense, you're normalizing the fact that privacy doesn't matter all that much or making it easier to attack anyone else's privacy. And conversely, we've seen through history, and I'll go back to that in a second, that um, you know, privacy exploitation is a very good example of privatized gains for socialized losses. Um, but I don't wanna get too meta here, so I'm gonna jump back into privacy for Web2. Uh, I think you may have caught the joke. I will fix this slide right now. And uh, yes, let's talk about privatized uh, losses, or rather privatized gains and socialized losses. So at its core, privacy in Web2 has two really fundamental issues, I think. First, the obvious one. There's a monetary incentive to subvert privacy in the data model of Web2, which is to say, I provide infrastructure for you as a service provider. You don't pay me for it, but in exchange, I sell you for it. Um, the second issue is a little bit more subtle, but it is basically a handoff of user data, of user state, to corporations in exchange for better UX. Uh, put simply, I think, you know, no one wants to run their own servers. And so we've basically agreed to have someone else run it for them to have someone else control our data in order to get a better experience online. Um, so we need alternative business models. We need better permission standards. Now, thankfully, I hope I'm gonna strike a, a positive note by saying the system will likely not make it. And with that, I jump to the next section, which is talking about my work and data sovereignty on the web. Um, so we have the opportunity, I think, to completely change how user data is handled on the web, to coordinate, to create a system in which as individuals we can actually exercise a bit more freedom over who gets to see our data and when. Um, I'll name the goal. I think the goal is data sovereignty. That's how most people talk about it. What does it mean? Well, it means users have ultimate control over who gets to see what about them when. It means express expressive revocable permissions and it means data portability. My data follows me across the web where I want it to go. If app A has my data and I log into app B, and I grant app B access to my data, app B can get it. Now, obviously this is a key unlock for users, but this is also a key unlock for devs. It means you don't have to manage user data or the infrastructure related. It means regulatory compliance becomes easier. It means you can onboard people much more easily. You have access to a social graph that was you know, hitherto impossible for you to get. And you get to build magical new experiences through interoperability. How are we doing? Well, right now, I think this is the state of Web3 data sovereignty. As developers, I think we're stuck between Scylla and Shardbus. On the left, you have, you know, the question is, what do I do with my user data? I have these systems that are split between uh, a client, a browser, a mobile app, and the chain, shared state. Um, what am I to do with user data, with personal information? Well, I can either put it on chain, which is a terrible idea because chains are very good ways of uh, verifying data, but they're not particularly good at privacy. They're transparent by default. Or I can dump it in a siloed database of old, the way we've always done it. Um, and it's a fair question to ask what's a developer to do. I think building a great product's hard enough. And, you know, I want to focus on building the experience I want for my users. I don't want to reinvent the data stack as a developer building a product. And so this is sort of the you know, urgent call to action is I think unless we make user data handling simple for developers, we'll go back to what we know, which is to say siloed exploitative data systems. Uh, so hopefully, uh, there, the, you, you, I've conveyed that there's urgency 
to fix these systems now. I think we're, 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 we're running against the clock. So here, I, I'm going to shill for a second, but I promise uh, there's, a, there's a deeper point to this, so bear with me. Um, I am working on a system called Privy. Privy builds simple APIs to manage user data off-chain. Now, what that actually means is Privy allows you to associate user data to wallets privately. We allow you to take on user PII, associate it to an on-chain address, so you can build richer UX without putting your users at risk. How does it work? Well, at its core, this is a cobbling together of four systems. There's a key management system, there's a permissions delegation system, there's a storage system, and there's a local client. The KMS manages all of the cryptography under which user data is encrypted from the client. The permissions, well, actually, let me pop back a step for a second. Um, using Privy, you basically integrate Privy into your front end, and your user inputs data into their app, into your app. Um, Privy basically takes care of encrypting that data client side using keys that are unique to the data in question. It sends the ciphertext up to a data store where if you have write permissions over that data, the data store ciphertext is overwritten with the new ciphertext. And when you need the data back, it checks whether you have read access to that specific user data. And if you do, it pulls ciphertext from the data store, pulls the appropriate data keys, and decrypts the data again locally. Privy itself never sees any user data, and every piece of data is encrypted under its own unique set of keys. So walking this back, we have these four main systems, the KMS, which manages data keys for every piece of data, the permissions delegation engine, which enforces data permissions, um, the storage system, which holds the ciphertext, and everything's brought together inside of local clients that run on your user's browsers, on your user's apps, to put all this together. Now, I'm going to point at this little box here, hosted infrastructure. What does that mean? Well, it means that today the KMS are run on hardware security modules. The permissions delegation is run by Privy's own permission agent, and the storage is run on managed infra. So now I get the inclination of my Web3 sort of brothers and sisters, which is to clutch our pearls and say, but my god, this sounds so centralized. Um, and it does. And I think there's a very good reason for it. And namely, it is that we are running against the clock. We need to build better DevX in order for people to adopt sovereign data systems before the clock, run, clock runs out. So what that means is we have to build experiences that are really simple. The interfaces have to be super, super smooth before we can go on to actually build the protocols that manage all of this. But this architecture is the foundation for an open data system, and I'll kind of walk you through how. So the thing I've talked about right now is basically fixing the developer issue. Privy allows you to associate user data or wallets privately so you can build better products. And what I'm describing here is the user issue. Privy allows you, as a user, to control your data throughout the web. How do we get from A to B? And I think that's through user choice. Ultimately, for me, decentralization is valuable insofar as it gives users the ability to control where they want their data hosted, how they want their permissions informed, less so because of the fact that, say, the data is split amongst however many nodes. But this means that the KMS, instead of being run on managed HSMs, can be run through your wallet. This means the permissions delegate can live on chain, and you can actually delegate to any party you choose. This means that storage can happen wherever you want, on IPFS, or Filecoin, in the cloud, on your local storage or home. The question then, and this is why I've been talking about Privy this entire time, other than sort of you know playing my book, is uh, who pays for sovereignty? Because in the first case, we've got a very simple business model. It's SaaS. You, know, you use infrastructure, you pay for it. We've, we've been doing this for the last 15 years. But who pays for the shared data system? And this is the last part of my talk, which is how do we actually fund a sovereign data system? How do we build uh, a sort of self-sustained common good in this way? I think, first, that path dependency has made a truth clear, which is we've had 30 years of Web2. And there's no going back. Users will never pay for privacy at scale. The joke maybe is that we've been paying for it this entire time, but we certainly won't agree to be charged for it. So what then? How do we actually get sort of incentives to work properly in the system so it can be um, run in perpetuity under user control? So I, I squint at this picture here, and I see data. I see data flowing here. I see data flowing here. I see data flowing here. And I think to myself, man, 
granting access to this data. If a user signs up through my app, Uniswap, and I grant access to a sovereign global data network, I should be compensated for it because I'm basically contributing to that user's freedom online. I'm contributing to the public good. So granting access with informed consent should be incentivized, should be rewarded. And conversely, getting access to that data has value. Maybe you should pay for it. So I look back and I think about the now zombie, but once beautiful BitTorrent and the really simple tit for tat economics of it. Uh, in BitTorrent, you have peers exchanging data. A peer can download data so long as it actually seeds data. You get data proportional to your contributions. So the straw man here might be, okay, so are we saying that apps should contribute user data get, to get user data back? I think that's not a very good solution. You have availability issues. As an app provider, when do I decide when to turn on my data faucet or not? The pricing is super unclear. A certain piece of data is not worth the same for app A and app B. Netflix doesn't value your SSN half as much as, say, JP Morgan does. Um, and there's a synchronicity issue. If I contribute data in October, is it okay for me to get paid in December? Thankfully, there's a token for that. Uh, and namely, I think crypto economics can come to the rescue. Uh, I think we can use a utility token to intermediate this tit for tat and help price user data in a self-sovereign system. I'm running up on time, but I'm almost done, I promise. Um, this is a three-party system. You have users who are contributing data to the system in exchange for getting be basically better experiences throughout the web. You have apps who are the sort of means to which data is ingested and uh, displayed to the users. And then you have data delegates. These are the infrastructure providers. This is the permissions provider. This is the storage layer. This is the KMS. Um, you can use a token to basically intermediate all the economic interactions around this. The way it would work is users pick their infrastructure provider. I decide that I trust Alice, Bob, and Eve with you know, my KMS permission system and uh, storage system, respectively. Data that I put in through an app is then tagged with a set of refreshers. I call this the app, which is responsible for actually ingesting the data into the system. So you know, I log into Uniswap, I provide them with my email, say. Um, Uniswap is then associated to my email as being the latest refresher, the party that has last sort of been responsible for me adding to the sovereign data network. I just said that. Um, and then queries and downloads from data stores are actually priced by the requester. The app requesting data gets to set a price and the fee is split between the refresher, meaning the app that contributed my data to the sovereign data store, and the infrastructure providers that are running the data store. Now, the token here is ex exceptionally useful in that it actually allows us to mediate a number of fairly complex economic curves. You probably have a, a cost floor for infrastructure providers. I think it should be clear that infrastructure providers should have to provide data if they're asked, but obviously they should be able to sustain this at least at cost, so you have a, a floor there. You probably want to unlock additional services like privacy preserving compute as another set of uh, infrastructure providers here. You want to price in the relative data value for a given request. Your data value changes over time. Uh, my phone number is far less valuable now than it was probably 40 years ago when the internet didn't exist. Um, and finally, the refresher set probably values apps differently. Data that I provided through AOL 15 years ago is less valuable than data I provided through Uniswap yesterday, if only because one of them is stale. So in conclusion, I hope I've conveyed that privacy issues on the web require coordinated solutions. I think this is a commons that we can actually fund. Oh, my slides are messed up. Web3 gives us the opportunity to get out of the privacy commons trap. Time is of the essence, and the game's playing out now as the sort of stack that we're building on comes into shape. And we have to make doing right by users super, super easy for developers. And then I think there's a thank you slide. Here it is. Thank you. <laughs>